All right, I will go ahead and <clears throat> call the February Board of Commissioners meeting to order. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the NRA Board of Commissioners meeting. We are broadcasting this meeting live on a virtual platform. For your reference, all information shared today is available online at www.nrha.us in the Board of Commissioners section. We will allow for public comment uh, today, and virtual participants will have the opportunity to raise their hands to comment. Attendees may also use the chat feature to make their comment as well, and I will share those prompts uh, as we go into that mode. Uh, again, thanks everyone for attending this morning's meeting. I'm hoping to emergency fire. Rescue isn't for here. Um, we have a very full agenda today that will include several presentations uh, and a closed session. Now I invite your comments, if any, on the minutes from the January 13th board meeting, which uh, begins on page three uh, of your uh, packet. Having Having read all 13 pages, <laughs> I make a motion that we accept them. All right, may I have a second? Having done so as well, I'll second. <laughs> it's almost like just being there, right? <laughs> we got such a, uh, well, I don't want to break the motion up, but our, our attorney and our secretary is so great at doing the minutes. <laughs> makes it easy. There you go. Thank you, sir. <laughs> We'll call the roll. Commissioner Albert? Uh, aye. Commissioner Arrington? Aye. Commissioner Benassi? Okay, can you hear us? Commissioner Benassi, can you hear us for your vote on the minutes? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Thank okay. you. Okay, great. Commissioner Gresham? Aye. Chairman Dutatio? Aye. <clears throat> <laughs> Commissioner Perry? Aye. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> well, they were doing it sort of in <laughs> alphabetical order. <laughs> I apologize. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, thanks. Uh, because we have such a very full agenda, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and put the public comments period up now to take care of anybody so they don't have to wait for the full, very full agenda. So if you would check, see if anyone is out in the hallway. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, virtual participants, if you would like to make a comment, please click on the raise your hand icon on your screen and you will be uh, called upon. <clears throat> you may also type a comment into the question box on your screen as well. When called upon, please address the virtual room by stating your first and last name, <clears throat> address, and your comment. Please know that questions asked during this time may not be responded to, but instead we will make arrangements to follow up <clears throat> with you after the meeting to address your concern. Do we have anyone who's raised their hand? Yes. Mr. Chairman, no one, we have no hands raised at this time. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> one last check in the hallway. We do okay. have one presenter, one speaker. Okay. Uh, Rachel, yeah. we're, we're doing the public comment now because we got a ton of presentation, so we want to take advantage of everyone's time. So if you have something, no, no, no. all right, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> again, checking, do we have anyone virtual? We have no virtual questions or no hand questions. All right, then I will go ahead and call the public comment uh, period to close. Uh, we're now going to move on. Again, a very full agenda. Uh, the remarks from the executive director, Ron. Okay. <clears throat> Good 
Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, guests. Good morning. Uh, I just have a few items I wanted to uh, mention to you today. So the one item is a follow-up uh, to the meeting that we had with uh, Mr. Ray Charm White when he came to address the board back in December. And we, Don and I, met with Ray Charm to sort of narrow down the, the most important items. There were five items that we uh, were introduced to when we met with uh, Ray Tron, that was back in January. We had the opportunity from that meeting to meet with staff to talk about some of his concerns and see where we are and being able to address those concerns that he had. So when we felt comfortable enough to, to have a follow-up meeting, we had that meeting yesterday with Ray Tron. And I would say in general, he, he's here. It was positive, it was a positive meeting. Uh, I think he realized that we, you know, we're serious about you know, how we interact with the residents, that we, you know, that we try to be more responsive. Uh, I, I would say, if anything, uh, we just have to reemphasize amongst our staff to be more customer service oriented. Not that we're, it's not that we're, I would say we're, we're not all doing it, but it needs to be more consistent. You know, when, when it comes to one of the items that he had was to, when a resident has a complaint, you know, something about a, a, an unauthorized resident or an unauthorized pet, they call the office, but there's no follow-up. The same way with, you know, when there's, there's a maintenance complaint that's given to staff, there's no follow-up to say, hey, you know, we received your your maintenance work or received your complaint, we're looking into it. So we have to do a better job along those lines. And we admitted that, you know, we have to. And so a lot of it, a lot of the items really relate to customer service because I think that if we're not responsive, it's like it's like we don't care. And even if we are not able to respond quickly by acknowledging that we've received a complaint or maintenance work order and just saying that, hey, I, I've got your information, I received your information, I received your call, let us work on it, I think that goes a long way. We just have to do a better job in making sure that we a more responsive to residents' concerns and complaints. And that was a that was a big uh, part of it. There were some particular items that we said that we were going to agree to to follow up on uh, with Raytron. Uh, another thing, and these are sort of big picture things in terms of community engagement. We realized that that was such an important part of the organization. That's why we <coughs> put it out in its own at the community engagement department. So what they're trying to do is position themselves with the staff and resources to be able to be more engaged with, with the residents, that the residents have a voice. We don't want people that are going to promote any agenda from NRHA. We want people who are going to actually, uh, like a community relations person or, or economic uh, opportunities manager, we really want them to work with the residents and not so much carry our agenda, but almost to the point of being an advocate for the residents. So that's what we're trying to position the, 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 the community engagement department to be. Uh, we, under, we also understand that there's some long-term things in terms of technology and things like that that would help us in terms of communicating with residents. We talked about, for example, like even like phone calls and things like that, or just understanding that people have different modes of communicating. Not everyone is computer savvy or you know whatever, but we have to have sort of the full spectrum of we need to be able to communicate over the full spectrum of the communication devices to be able to reach people. You know, even if they call, even if we need to put out information about what's going on in the community, we should have a different means of being able to do that. So so some of the those things we are working on, you know, we 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 working with our IT department. We actually had a meeting with uh, the IT department on some of the things that they're doing in terms of trying to put more customer <coughs> resident technology in there from, like I said, even from receiving phone calls to having resident portals so that there's information available to them. They can get all their information online. They can report work orders. They can call in work orders. So we want to be able to, that we're, we're more focused for residents and have a way they communicate with us that we make sure that those means are, are available. And those are more long-term things, <coughs> really the short-term things that we just need to reemphasize how important uh, 
customer services and being more responsive. Because that does go, like I said, that goes a long way. And I'm sure that Greg Trump will, will, will agree with that. So uh, Don was in the meeting. I don't know if he had anything to add. And also Mike, Mike Clark. If there's no, I think we, we've got a number of uh, things that we'll be working on in front of us, some short term, you know, whatever cliche you want to say, low hanging fruit, that kind of, kind of thing. But some of these other things really are uh, ones that we would have to make some serious changes on. Right. And uh, the real realization of uh, they need to move forward, and uh, that's what we're going to do. And Mike, I didn't know if you could hear me, if there's anything you wanted to add. No, I think you, you gentlemen have pretty much covered it. Thank you. That's it. All right. So I'll move on to the next item is uh, the COVID-19 impact on our operations, as I reported to you last time. Uh, and that was around uh, about the middle of June. We had about 30 folks out. Either they were they were infected or they were exposed. As of a couple days ago, we only had one person that was infected and one person that was out due to exposure. So, the, you know, we're seeing an amount decline and the Omicron variant, and also I would say the, the folks that were impacted, you know, the folks that we do have were pretty much uh, not hindered by any of the uh, infections that are, that, that are going on. As you can tell, a lot of uh, states that have been impacted are loosening up their, you know, their mask mandates and things like that. What we're going to do here is just going to continue on with some of the things that we put in place until about the middle of February. Just to make sure we don't, you know, from what I've read, I don't see anything, another variant of any concern, at least I haven't heard of any, of any concern that's coming on the tails of the Omicron variant. So I think you'll probably see more, more, <coughs> more workplaces sort of gradually roll back some of the, the safety uh, protocols that they put in place. And I think we're going to, like I said, we're going to take a look at that. And also, it would be really good to some of our like committee meetings and other meetings, resident meetings that we've sort of been a little hesitant to try to hold that we can hopefully by the middle of February, you know, the end of or uh, March, that people feel a lot more comfortable where we could have those kind of meetings. Because those, you know, we, I think we really benefit from those type of meetings, <laughs> the, you know, the virtual, to get sometimes it gets a little awkward, I think. <laughs> There's a lot of things that you pick up on, you know, even with nonverbal communication and things like that are just as important instead of the actual words themselves. And I think those are really important. And I think we can hopefully be able to get back to having more of those in person meetings uh, with staff and, and most importantly with residents. Um, in terms of uh, staff shortages, which we've had to you know, deal with in addition to the uh, the pervasiveness of the, of the uh, COVID-19. Uh, it's had an impact on our uh, staff shortage. It's had an impact on our operations, especially when we had the number of folks out due to the virus. But now that we folks have recovered and back to work, we're still dealing with staff shortages, and primarily in our maintenance department, where you know over that course of time, the work order has filled up. And so we're uh, trying to come up with some strategies and you know, trying to employ people, we, we brought in uh, temporary work agencies. We uh, reached out to our professional recruiting firms for some of our other uh, some of our other vacant positions that have been out for a while. You know, we're looking at if there's any monetary type of incentives that we can do. These these are things that you know all other <laughs> other employers are dealing with as, as well. So, you know, we, we understand that that's a really important part. I mean, we, we looked at, you know, are there opportunities for private management in some of our some of our places where we could actually turn over development to private management? Because we, we have, you know, part of the tag report was looking at outsourcing. So there may be some opportunities. There are some areas <coughs> where we can't staff up to an adequate level to be able to address resident needs. Uh, so, uh, so those are some of the strategies. Hopefully, you know, we'll, you know, there's some other ideas we're looking at. It. We've heard some, what some other housing authorities are doing. I mean, they're looking at making sure that they, 
their wages, their offering living wages. That's really an important thing that you know people can afford to live in the area where they work. And we haven't gone that far yet, but you know that may be something that we have to take a look at as well as addition to the other monetary incentives. Uh, also, sort of related, I wanted to uh, the the family that was uh, that had the unfortunate maintenance. Issue that was highlighted by Wavy TV 10, the uh, Courtney Burwell family. Uh, as of, I think, uh, as of the end of January, we did take care of all the maintenance related issues, uh, the, mold, <coughs> the mold and everything, the remediation, all of that has been done. Uh, but we're also looking for to offer other housing assistance uh, for the family. So that's where we are now. But all the maintenance issues have been cleared up. And we know, like in Young's Terrace, that that's going to be an ongoing problem. And one of the things that we want to do that would help some of the some of the uh, I would say some of the uh, pressures on the staff because they're currently having to address the mold remediation and other things, especially in our older buildings. It's just not it's not built the way that would be conducive to talk, sort of keep mold out of the building, you know, sort of an exhaust and things like that that they don't. That the buildings don't uh, that the buildings don't have. So we're trying to bring on mold remediation firms. Uh, we also have a number of firms that have expressed interest in helping us with unit turnaround. Currently, our staff is doing that, but if we could bring in contractors to be able to do that, that would alleviate some of the pressure off the staff, so they can do just work orders. So we have a. I think the bids are due. I think it's. I think it's the end of this week where we have we have a number of contractors that have expressed interest in both either remote remediation as well as unit turnaround. So hopefully we'll be able to by the end of this week we'll have uh, at least preliminarily we have some firms that you know we could consider to put them in contract and then by uh, the next couple of weeks after that they'll actually have people we'll have firms that are doing a mold remediation in our Terrace and some of our other developments, and also uh, contractors helping us on the unit term. Uh, the last, I, well, a couple items: the safety and security. I know that you know crime is, you know, there's uh, pretty pervasive all over. There are crime rates. I've, I've heard with some of the cities that they haven't seen crime rates like this since the 1990s when they were really high, and you know they were steadily going down up until a couple of years ago. Now they've really increased. And I know that the Biden administration had talked about, well, we need to find other strategies to address crime. And I think that that sort of brought about that needs to be another component to it and, and sort of just law enforcement. And one of the things I, that I've seen here in, in the city of Norfolk, and I commend uh, uh, Mayor Exen, Miller Alexander and Chief Boone is that they brought a couple of initiatives to the city that I think they're going to help address uh, crime in the city as a whole, which we will be in our communities will be beneficiaries of anything anything that's successful along those two initiatives. And I'm just going to briefly mention a couple. I was invited to, to be a part of a press conference that Chief Boone called me. He was trying to emphasize how how uh, important it was for the for the police to be able to address straw purchase straw gun purchases, and that's basically where someone who legally can purchase a firearm purchases it, but it then they they sell it or give it to someone who probably wouldn't be able to pass the background check. And there was a uh, at the press conference there was an ATF officer there who talked about one situation where there was an ex uh, a former Norfolk State student. Who within one year purchased 45 firearms. <clears throat> 15 of those firearms were used in the commission of crime. So, and, and that's, you know, that was just one example. And so Chief Bloom was just wanting to bring attention to that. And hopefully, you know, if there's any legislation or things that could really help curtail that kind of, uh, that kind of transaction from taking place, I mean, it could be through that, or it could be where you have gun owners who aren't really responsible and they're stolen and things like that. It all 
And most of them do wind up in the commission of some type of crime. But and I'm sure that you know Karen <clears throat> Karen rolled up security officer can talk about how crime that's on our community when guns are recovered, they're the the person who had possession was not the original owner of the gun. So that's really you know, that's something that's really important. That's an initiative that I think is really going to be helpful for the city as a whole as well as our community. And the second initiative is to uh, the city the uh, city of Norfolk's project safe neighborhoods. And this is something that was adopted by the, the uh, Department of Justice. It was a program that started in Boston back in nineteen ninety six. And they wanted to come up with a different way of sort of addressing crime. There was something they saw a lot of repeat offenders with crime and crime. So what they did is instead of, uh, you know, just, hey, you know, giving the message that, you know, if you do it again, we're going to call you back in. They tried a different model. What they did is they had sort of three components of meeting with these sort of repeat <coughs> offenders or potential repeat offenders. They, you know, they talked about, hey, you know, if you do this again, this is what you're looking for this community, we will not tolerate it. But they also had a moral voice that is, that is a part of addressing those issues. And then they also provided service. And so what they saw is that when you address those kind of issues, especially people aren't innately criminal, but there's usually something behind it. You know, there may be some housing instability, there could be drug abuse or things like that. So what they did is anybody who's in within the system or if they're on parole, they've been arraigned, what they do is bring them in. So you have the law enforcement there, but we're not going to tolerate it. You have the moral voices, community or uh, people voices in the community. We're not going to take this anymore, but then you have the services. Where can we help you stay on a straight path? So if you address housing issues, if you address drug abuse, there's been a lot of success for it. So I'm really glad to see that I was invited to be a part of this work. Because we had a <coughs> meeting back in January. We're going to have a, a follow-up meeting. And so I, I'm really excited about it because I have read some of the success stories that other municipalities who've been using this model for a number of years now, and they've seen some success. So when I started off mentioning the box, the Boston model, that was the original model, they actually saw a 63% decline in, in youth homicide. So I think that's something that you know we could uh, replicate here. And I'm pretty sure we'll probably have the same benefit citywide, also our community. So I'm really grateful to be a part of that. And I'm looking forward for us continuing to get to the point of having some type of meetings with people who have the potential to be repeat offenders. Uh, and then the, just uh, uh, this is the, the, I'm not sure related to that. We have a, a group or a small group with, that we're looking at implementing some safety features within our communities. Those two items are more large scale items, but we also realize that there are other items that we need to address within our communities, in which I'll uh, talk about uh, up, uh, once we meet again. I'll have some more details on some of the things we're looking at implementing in our community. And then the last thing I just wanted to bring up was the strategic plan process that I talked about. Last month, we actually started working with straight, straight path management. Uh, we have uh, we have a, we had a couple, we had our kickoff meeting, I think it was uh, that week after the, the week after the board meeting, where we sort of talked about what do we want terms of what the strategic plan is going to look like, we actually started to do some information gathering, some data gathering, and we we're also uh, trying to uh, get some names of, of folks in the community we call thought leaders or influencers in the community. They don't necessarily have to be advocates for NRHA. We want to hear different perspectives, but we want them to be a part of the focus group. We want to be able to get their perspective on what they think about in our HA, so we can be able to address some of their concerns. And so that's a really important part. So when we do come to the board, when it gets to the retreat stage, you can understand what the community thinks, you know, different perspectives, how they view in our HA. We want to hear from the residents. We're going to, we're going to do surveys, we're going to do focus groups with the residents as well. What do they think of NRJ? 
industry as well as the employees. So all of that comes together. The board will be able to look to see what we're doing, some of the things that you all think are important that we need to be concentrating on. Um, hopefully by next <coughs> month, I'll have some, some more firm dates. We're looking at May in terms of when we're actually going to have the retreat uh, with the board. So that's all I have. Uh, I'm sure if you have any questions, uh, uh, for me, yeah. A quick question. Yes. Yeah. What is the CPD <coughs> assessment? It's the SEPTED Crime Prevention through Environmental Design. And Sorry. it's a lighting and yeah, um, the way the buildings are. Yeah, the, yes. Got it. Yeah, that's that's what it is. Normally, you know, uh, now nowadays when you <coughs> in the design phase, you usually let someone take a look at it before you actually start building things out of the ground. You know, back then that wasn't even a concept back then, you know, when we look at young and things like that. When you take a look at it, and they, you know, I always talk about sight lines and just the density and things like that, the street circulation, all of those things would, you know, they would not, it, it just wouldn't pass any kind of, you know, in terms of environmental design. And so that's, uh, that's what we're looking at, especially with young and, and long-term, mid to long term, maybe there's some ways if we say for example if we don't demolish, maybe there's ways to de densify it and then open it up and maybe there's some opportunities to to help with the street circulation open it up so it won't be so uh, it won't be so attractive for people trying to evade from you know evade from the police. And currently the way it is, you can hide pretty much anywhere. Uh, so that's that's what that is. And so we could probably get some suggestions. Uh, yeah, it's just yeah. an acronym. I yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Right. <coughs> yeah. Your small group that you're talking about is that in house? Yes, it's an in, in, in house. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just uh, a collection of folks from all the different. Well, know. actually, I, mm -hmm. I, I I sort of misspoke on that. We actually that was the part of a larger group that included chief rooms uh -huh. of folks from the uh, Commonwealth the uh, Commonwealth Attorney's Office that we had an initial meeting which was not too long after we had the, the unfortunate deaths in, in, in our community and so we met and so as a part of that each one of those participants in that in that meeting they all had sort of things that they needed to work on so there were some things that we were working on in our community, things that we probably have to get approval for the city. You know, we're looking at speed bumps. Is there ways to ingress, egress, those kind of things? We're looking at parking passes, I, you know, uh, resident IDs. Uh, we also <coughs> were looking at, you know, the, uh, some housing authorities actually took ownership of the right of way. Uh, we advanced that, as, you know, and Delphi can tell you, we talked about that a, about a year or so ago, and it's just sort of sat there to get into some constitutional thing. But it's, so we can't control the, the, the well, street right away? I, I asked about it again, because it, it, it has, it, that, that has happened in other cities. I think Portsmouth, we actually have Oakley. Oakley is where we own the, the street, the right of way. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's not that it, it hasn't happened, it's just we need, like I said, we've talked talk with the city, hey, these are some of the things we think that would really, really help. Uh, so it's it just, that particular one hasn't gotten anywhere. Some of the other things like the speed bumps and things like that, I think will be a lot easier to be able to do. I know Karen has worked with NSU with the, the shot fire <coughs> technology that's you could actually pinpoint where you know shots are, are coming from. Um, also, Karen was going to uh, make a trip up to Richmond uh, to see some of the things that they've done, and we're also looking at that with <coughs> other housing authorities. So that's yeah. our group, but it's a, it is a part. And I, did, I didn't mention that, but it's a part of a larger group right. that we're all looking at. Um, yes. Can I ask um, in a gated community? That is, is that privately owned property, and then they have their gated persons 
let people in or is that owned by the city but they got gated someone to let people in is that considered would it be say like young say like young and you gated Huh? Say like, you mean like if we gated young? Yeah, say like if that. you say for example, if you gated young, yeah. and you only let who lives there with yeah. a permit or something, is that le is that legal? I don't know. I know that Richmond's tried it. I don't think it worked out very well. But Can I know you, that uh, repeat that, Ron. Uh, Ron, what Ron okay. said. What was it? The gating, gating the community uh -huh. is that is that legal? Oh, yeah. uh, so uh, we could talk about that. That's that's a complex t yeah. topic. But as of right now, no. From the standpoint that the streets in your low-income public housing communities belong to the city of Norfolk, other than in Oak Leaf, where you own the streets. So theoretically. If we're looking just at street ownership and not at other issues with gated communities, and there are other issues, but theoretically for open <coughs> then potentially that's an option. For your other communities, it is not an option because those streets are public streets where people are allowed to walk back and forth within the community on these streets and, for example, exercise their First Amendment rights on these streets. Um, so you, we cannot just close that off um, as of right now. And we've had discussions yeah. with the city leadership mm -hmm. with regard to the ownership of the streets. And that is unfortunately um, a topic that is fraught with legal issues and ramifications, uh, complex ramifications as to whether or not those streets could become private streets. Okay. Isn't, isn't uh, Matthew Shaw try that one time? I don't know. What was that? You know, was that? Well, I'm not sure. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Ron. Uh, it's not gated, but okay. it's a uh, upscale. Yeah, upscale. It's sort of it's designed like a club community, but it's really not. Okay. And there uh, used to be uh, uh, low and moderate income, and they could use speed bumps and stuff. Oh, right. Okay. okay. And so uh, they tore it down. Okay. The city redeveloped it in conjunction yeah. with also real estate and yeah. built some really upscale homes in there. Okay. So it looks gated, but it's yeah. not. Okay. And I think they made an attempt at trying to make it gated, but because of right. the issue that yeah. Delphine just articulated, yeah. public streets right. have to be granted okay. egress and egress. Right. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. The, the engineer and the oh, okay. thing, yeah. Okay. But I know like in, uh, I remember just hearing about like these places that are, you could, I can't hear you, Ron. Places that have like homeowner associations, yeah. they basically own the, but they own the all the the rights of ways and everything, and so they're able to to, to gate it. But I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I I heard that Richmond, I heard that Richmond tried to gate the community, but I know, uh, like I said, Karen was going to go up there and find out what how they were able to do that, or if it's still even effective. From what I read, it didn't sound like it was the way. It, I mean, people were still able to get in, and you know, the uh, it, it, it just didn't appear. But I, uh, once Karen gets up there to find out, I mean, that'll give us some input as to you know, if that's something really worth pursuing. I mean, it it does appear to be, but you know, you just never know. Like some of the issues that Delphine talked about, that we have to be able to address. And I don't, I don't know if we're in a position to be able. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right, uh, okay. uh, just got to note that there is a, an individual who'd like to make a comment. Uh, is that individual here or is it virtual? Uh, this individual is virtual and there is a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, so the question, I believe, is in response to. Uh, we cannot hear you. Can you? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, the question, I believe, is in response to something Ron mentioned. Um, the question, there are several questions from uh, Mr. Vincent Hodges. What call exactly if social workers aren't involved in this planning? This planning is flawed from the beginning. Be close. Um, Makisha, we, we can't can. hear you at all. I'm sorry. 
The question is from Vincent Hodges, and the question is, what small group exactly? If social workers aren't involved in the planning, the planning is flawed from the beginning. And there are a few other questions to comment. All right, but let him know that, uh, as we said, we typically don't answer questions directly, but we will have someone get back and answer those questions. Okay? All right, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is, I believe, a presentation. <coughs> I'm sorry, Commissioner, there's one other there's one other comment from a Vincent LaSalle. Okay. And this is just saying that uh, his hand had been raised. Um, he is not happy about the meeting starting late. Uh, but there's no specific question okay. listed. Yes, I think we'd all like to start on time, but sometimes technology gets in the way. Okay, uh, if we can go ahead and move on to uh, page 19 in your packet, and it's the Broad Creek Section 18 disposition, and uh, I'll turn it over. I believe Mr. Powell. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. The, uh, the presentation, there was some last minute changes, so that the presentations uh, that you have on your desk are probably more accurate. more accurate, yes. Okay. Do we know how to get to Mr. Powell? Um, yeah, he, he was on. Oh, there he yeah. was. Okay. <laughs> uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I will try the screen share if you bear with me one second. Can someone tell me what screen? I have a few screens, but can someone tell me what screen is being shared? I'm learning this uh, platform. Hold on a screen. second. It's your desktop. Okay. Um, the, so, the, okay. Hold on one second. So as the presentation being shared, I'm I'm just not able to determine what's being shared. It's still your desktop. Okay. Yeah, I'm let's see. You can't see as you folks go in front of it. Yeah, let's see. Screen of the main monitor. Let's let's try another one. There we go. Okay. 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 So the presentation is being shared now. Yes. Okay. Um, um, good morning, commissioners, uh, leaders of NRHA, and guests. I'm Juan Powell. I'm a vice president of real estate development with the community builders. And I'm um, grateful for the opportunity to share um, what's going on at Broad Creek with our recapitalization. I know you have a busy agenda, so I will try to uh, make this pretty time efficient, but we'll go through an overview, talk about progress to date, a financial overview, uh, preliminary schedule, and I will also have Steve Morales um, join me for next steps. And so from a, a very big picture perspective, 
um, the work at Broad Creek Renaissance will be what HUD calls a Section 18 disposition. In this process, we go through a conversion to project-based vouchers um, from um, public <clears throat> housing units. And this conversion process is what allows us to generate uh, the low-income housing tax credits and also allows us to support the debt that will be able to be used to renovate the project. Um, I'll show a phasing map in a second, but we're planning on doing all the work in three phases. Those phases will take place over the next three years between now and 2025. After the pro project has been renovated, all phases, um, stabilized with the residents back in their homes, and then the property will convey to NRHA, who will um, be the owner of the property for the long term. And so um, Broad Creek Renaissance, um, other than Broad Creek 5, was developed in six phases. Uh, because of some of the regulations re related to uh, low-income housing tax credits, uh, we are doing a phased approach to renovate the property. Uh, the first phase will be um, Bowling Green 2 and 3. Uh, the second phase will be Marshall Manor 2 and 3. And the third phase will be Marshall Manor 4 along with Bowling Green 4. And so it's a total of 300 housing units, uh, roughly a third in each of the three phases. Um, this project has been going on for uh, quite a while and um, we've made just uh, tremendous uh, progress over that time frame. Uh, TCB has been working arm in arm with NRHA um, working on the Section 18 um, strategy, planning for long-term ownership of the property. Um, there's a lot of historic matters that have been um, worked through. Um, we've agreed on a uh, MOU between NRHA and TCB. Um, this was a uh, very major milestone uh, both, you know, worked with TCB's leadership. Obviously, uh, Delphine was involved. And so we've, we've just worked collectively to really move this forward to get to the point uh, that we are today. And so as part of that process, we've gone through architectural proposals, selection. Uh, we've worked with a preliminary general contractor, but also will select a final general contractor. We've had our architect and civil engineer and appraiser um, engaged. And so quite a bit of work has already been done. One of the uh, material events that took place was uh, a new Virginia state law that dictated there's a 12 month notice period uh, be given to the residents before the time that a section 18 application could be um, submitted to HUD. And that um, process, that notice was in March of 2021. And, and so we're coming to the conclusion of that 12 month period, which puts us in a position to really start to move forward. Um, we've also been um, working um, incredibly strongly and collectively with other parties. Uh, we've engaged directly with HUD. We've engaged directly with Virginia Housing so that they are aware of the project. But one of the components that we're incredibly proud of is our level of community and resident engagement. Uh, we've had regularly scheduled meetings with the residents um, really starting over a year ago. And so our goal was, so, was to be in a position such that the residents were very aware of what's going on uh, relative to the project. And one of our other items that we're incredibly proud of is our level of engagement with Councilwoman Amy Johnson um, and Norfolk City government. 
we've created what's termed the Broad Creek Advancement Committee. We've also created a subcommittee. And this uh, collective effort is really focused on not only Broad Creek Renaissance, but the greater Broad Creek area and how to really advance this for both the residents and the larger community. And with Councilwoman Johnson's leadership and the engagement of uh, leaders from Norfolk City government, we're incredibly proud of the way NRHA and TCB has forged a really productive and positive alliance that we think will continue well after this project uh, concludes. <coughs> Um, what, you know, this project phase one is roughly a uh, 19 to $20 million project. It's really being generated by first mortgage debt that's supported by the rents. Um, there's also low income housing tax credits that are part of the capital stack. And, um, we're going through now and over really over the next several months, we'll work through our construction budget, construction prices, as I'm sure most people are aware, have escalated tremendously over the last 10 months. And so we're, we are going through the process. We think we've been very prudent in our budgetary approach, but as we start to go further into the year, move forward with our design, and get uh, further validation of numbers from our contractors, we'll be able to provide uh, budget updates as well. And so just um, what's yeah. ahead of us over this next time frame is that we will start to move forward with the Section 18 application. Um, and this is certainly an action that requires uh, board approval um, we will move forward with a bond application, a low-income um, housing tax credit application, and eventually move into a HUD subsidy layering review. We, our plan is to start work with uh, physical work on site uh, in end of third quarter, beginning of fourth quarter of this year for the first uh, project and the subsequent two phases would follow um, roughly a year apart. And so um, now again, we're very engaged in planning our uh, relocation strategy for the residents, understanding the physical needs and starting to move forward with our funding applications so that we'll be prepared to begin the project um, in the latter part of this year. Um, Steve, if you're available, I'd like to see if I could turn this component over to you. Just, uh, we're winding down the presentation. Good, uh, <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mariah with NRHA. Um, we're winding down the presentation. And what, what we're doing here today is this is a broad overview of the work um, and uh, preparing y'all for next month. Uh, next month, we formally come to the board with a resolution to permit us to go forth with a disposition application to HUD. Um, so it's part of a process that we felt it was best to come to the to the board this month so that next month you're not just hit with it all at once. So next month, we come back to the board with a resolution um, seeking your approval. That will permit the NRHA staff in order to move forward with an application to HUD. Um, and then that kicks off all the process um, or, or continues the process that Juan outlined. Um, a big item that we're, we're working on right now, as Juan noted, is we're working with the city um, on this as well. We do require a support letter from them. Um, so we're in the process of, of getting that um, uh, from the city and hope to have, we need to have that prior to your resolution. Uh, we're completing the, we just completed the environmental work. Um, and so we're, we're doing all the steps necessary in order to get us to the process of being able to move this to the, the Section 18 application to us. Um, it's been a long process, as, as Juan noted, we've actually started this a, a, a while ago. Um, so this is the culmination of, of, of a lot of the work um, that we've uh, been working on. Um, we are, as, as Juan also pointed out, we are a year delayed from where we were. We're actually had originally, we're gonna to come to the board with this action last March, 
but due to the state law, we delayed it till, till this March. Um, so at that point, um, happy to take any questions. Um, and again, this is a, a broad preview on what our, our goal is to be back for the board next, next March or, or next month with the resolution. Comments, folks? Juan? Yes. Uh, you know, we're looking at the 50,000 foot up view of this. Yes. How, how do we have assurance that uh, it's not going to go up another 9.1% the next time you come to us? Uh, usually, conceptual numbers come down. And I, I realize we've got supply chain and we've got COVID and all that. <laughs> But, um, uh, you know, how do we know we're getting a competitive number here, a, a market market uh, price number? And, yes. and the second, second part to that is you're talking about general contractors. Are you no longer working with Clancy and Phase, or are, they, are you uh, putting competition into their equation? Okay, yes, um, thank you for those questions. So, um, first of all, from a um, competitive market rate number, um, irrespective of the general contractor that we ultimately move with, move forward with, we will get a competitive bid from the subcontractor market. And that's for a couple of reasons. Obviously, competition, encourages uh, you know favorable or market rate pricing but secondarily we really do want to be active um, in what we as tcb call och or opportunity contracting and hiring and so that we have as broad a base of minority contractor engagement as possible and so that's part of our strategy is to really be in a position so that our general contractor um, is you know very much um, working with us with subcontractors in an open book manner so that we're getting qualified contractors but there's transparency on the pricing and ultimately uh, relative to the question of, of pricing and scope uh, we take two measures there we work with both our contractor uh, and our architect over this period of time to get preliminary pricing and that pricing really gives a good gauge of what's happening in the market and so that we, if necessary, can make adjustments to the scope to make sure that we're staying within the allocated budget. Um, there's also a question uh, relative to Clancy and Thays. We have been working with Clancy and Thays initially. Um, over the last few months, we've had more intense conversations. We've outlined uh, both the requirements of TCB and NRHA uh, relative to an inclusive contracting approach that includes uh, Section 3 companies, Section 3 workers, minority contractors. And um, I will say that based upon that conveyance of expectations, uh, Clancy and Thays uh, indicated that they did not believe they were the appropriate uh, contractor with those requirements in place. Could, could you go back to that? I didn't understand that. Well, could you say that again? Yes. When we started, um, Section 3 conformance is not optional on this project. Minority contractor engagement is not optional on this project. It's important. And when there was further clarity of the expectations of the project, we were advised by Clancy and Faze that they did not feel they were the appropriate general contractor. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, Juan, how is the um open book worked out is uh, Steve and his staff going to be able to see the uh, the numbers absolutely uh, we're we're partners in this uh, development NRHA and TCB and so there's total total transparency 
um, between us and with our general contractor on numbers. Thank you. The TCB has been incredibly forthcoming and, and transparent on all of our actions. We work very collaboratively together. We have a meeting every two weeks. We review all the numbers and go through things and talk about strategy. It is a very close collaborative relationship. I hope the money comes to your wallet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I had a uh, couple comments, but I, I guess I'm going to have to fold them into this comment because uh, I, I don't understand. I understand what you said now, and I understand how uh, that helps you with your uh, management strategy of the project. I don't understand how that gets us any closer to meeting our session three objectives. And uh, so, so uh, I guess a part of that challenge for me is uh, when we get a report like this uh, or an update, uh, yes, a briefing, you know, uh, yes, it, it really doesn't seem to focus in on any of the priorities of uh, the board of the uh, authority. And I don't know if that's because uh, our management team feels like, uh, you know, this is what we need to focus on right now and that's not important, or if we're not clear on how we feel about some of these, because uh, we certainly have gotten disjointed in uh, our priorities as it relates to the Board of Commissioners. I, I uh, have you know, one thing in mind as it relates to what I feel is important, uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Gresham may have another thing in mind as to what he feels is important. We haven't uh, gotten around uh, specifics and, you know, we see the community has some goals that are important, but they have to be considered in the context of what can be done in the project and all of that, what their staff does, all of those kinds of things, I understand that. But it just doesn't seem to be any real priority. And uh, and I go back to uh, the earlier question. And the reason I say it doesn't seem to be any real priority is because I don't want to prolong this report. But what I will say is, in years past, one of the things that I feel we've done more consistent than anybody I know is, somehow we braid with the aspirational or, or uh, we don't, we, we reward effort and not outcomes. And so if, if a team has made what we feel is a good faith effort, then just check the box and keep it moving. It doesn't matter that we don't get the right outcomes. And, and so, uh, Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it alone. But I, I know that uh, I'm probably the only person on this stage that, that, well, I can't speak to anybody. Else. I do want to respond, and, and hopefully it will, will, will help. Um, one of the things that we've done with this project is we've repeatedly gone to the various board subcommittees. So when we get into the very details on the project, we, we tend to handle those. Who is that, Don? Masaccio? Um, we've been Did you say Don? Uh, to the board subcommittee. Oh, okay. To the board subcommittee. Yeah. Okay. So we come to the board subcommittees and go over the, the project in detail. And they actually, from the board subcommittee, there have been clear items that do come through, as well as here at the board, clear items that do come through that we built into the project. Lon noted specifically section three. That's not a not a, a, a an option for discussion that's as whether you do it or don't do it. That is an absolute HUD requirement. It's built into the, the NRHA DNA on what we're trying to get to. And so it is a very important part of the project. And so our, our contractors will be essentially measured against that, that requirement. And if they're unable, if they feel that they're unable to meet that, um, then, then we can't go forward with them on that. Um, we also heard from the board um, a clear direction, um, although we're, I know the policy is still in, in development, the clear direction on the need for additional minority contracting. 
So as we've seen as part of the CNI project, and as we're also pulling in here into the Frog Creek project, that is a key goal of ours. The board subcommittees have also made it very clear they are extremely concerned about the financial ramifications of this project. And so we have a few items that are absolutely there. You know, essentially this project is to do no harm to NRHA with respect to our bottom line. It's also uh, one of the, the parameters that we've been tasked with, which has really pushed us to the direction, I say pushed, but guided us to the direction that we've been going, which is we don't have a lot of capital funds to handle the project. So right now it's a public housing project. It doesn't have the ability to take on the debt. And therefore, we decided to pursue the Section 18 and conversion to project-based vouchers so we could get additional tax credits as well as take on the debt, which would otherwise we would need either a, another HOPE 6 grant, which they don't exist, CNI grant, which we've already got one, so we wouldn't be likely to get, or or use our capital funds, which we don't have sufficient funds in order to do the full reno, uh, renovation. So from the board subcommittee, we, we were given clear direction. Do no harm to the authority on our bottom line. Conserve as much as possible the capital funds um, in, in doing this project. And so we have been building that into all of our work to ensure, one, that we get the rents right, that we, um, that we you know, get the, the, the phasing right. Um, a big issue is going to be relocation. Um, the whole management of the project through uh, vacancy management to get us so that we can do the rolling renovation. Um, and as, as uh, Mr. Gresham was talking about it, be very transparent and very forthcoming about the project details with respect to all the contracting, just so that we're not in a situation where we're quickly upside down. Um, I would say that even with the board action next month, that gives us the ability to submit for the application, and we can do that to, uh, in a phased um, disposition process to allow us to move forward. However, if we get to a point in our project where it stops penciling out, then that is a complete come back to the group and let's figure this out again, because we are not going to move forward with a project that violates the first you know, sort of item, which is do no harm to the authority and with respect to the finances. So, um, you know, the big thing here is when we started, we had multiple things to take care of. Um, Long-standing historic financial issues with Broad Creek that needed to be resolved. Um, um, more and more renovation issues um, that we know we needed to do um, that were going to either require capital funding or another approach. Um, and three was the... Uh, the tax credit uh, investors were exiting, and so it presented this opportunity to absolutely <coughs> accomplish the other two. Um, and so, over the past few years, um, really, you know, once that, you know, going back to the summer of 2020, a little bit actually before that is when we initially started discussion about the future of Broad Creek and how we needed to handle all these things. So, the NRHA team, the TCB team, has been working since that time to forge sort of what we felt was the best approach. And I think we're, we're still there. The COVID and the construction pricing has thrown a big wrench. Obviously, when we started, uh, when we started this process, there, we started pre-COVID. So this is kind of news, you know, because we started this again in 19 when we're talking about this. So we are still managing through that. So to, to say to the board is we're going to go forward no matter what. I can't say that because that's not what NRHA management would, would go for. That's not what the board would go for. So that's a, that would be a place of pause where we all have to figure it out again. Um, so from that standpoint, I, you know, I, I, I feel that we have tried to be very responsive to board comments uh, when we're up here uh, before the full board as well, particularly when we're also in the subcommittee. Um, from the city council side, we know relocation and people services are a big deal. And that is something that the teams are also working on. So there's a, a, a lot of uh, viewpoints and RHA management is really concerned because they're the same thing, do no harm. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ron is very concerned about ultimately how this reflects on the authority bottom line and our ability to, to keep Broad Creek um, as it is as a, as a very nice project and keep it moving forward in the future. 
um, you know, going back as we've known for a long time, Section 9, public housing and its financing is not great in the long term because the capital needs over time begin to escalate, but the money's just not there to support it. So this was our strategy to address it. Well, I, I commend you and Juan for the things I've heard today. And, uh, you know, it's better to find out now that uh, you and I have great respect for Clancy and Days, and, uh, but it, it's good to hear that uh, you're dealing with any potential issues now rather than at the last minute. And uh, I encourage that. Do no harm is incredibly important. Uh, Section 3 is incredibly important. And so, uh, and then all the things you're talking about, <coughs> financing and public housing, you know, that's the third. So you got a three-legged stool that you're trying to balance on. We could continue to make it part of a board update um, and then regular meetings with the subcommittees so that we keep the board uh, uh, fully informed about what is going on in the project, about the contracting, about the pricing, and about where things are at. That would be great, Steve, because although I yeah. understand the importance of this conversation about financing and contracting, um, the, the conversation about relocation and um, impact in the community is equally important and will become more important as we continue to walk down the line. So uh, a continued update around that are, uh, are good. We, we learned some lessons so say about relocation, and we all know that you know, that it's hard. It's just, it's just no matter what, how good the end result is going to be, it's just difficult. And when you do that in the mix with the renovation, the construction, and the, and the financing, it, it's a tough, um, a tough gig. So uh, that ongoing conversation with the board I think is really helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Thanks for allowing me to speak here. Other comments? Thank you again, Steve. Juan, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, our next one is uh, development, I believe. Ms. Mills. <laughs> I was going to hear for a minute. <laughs> well, take a minute. Good morning. I'm here for housing. Well, housing development. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioner. Good, Good morning. morning. Today, uh, I am presenting to you this morning the quarterly report that's in your package beginning on page 37. Uh, this is for the period ending December 31st of 2021, second quarter of FY22. As is usual, I'm going to highlight uh, the different components, different programs, um, and some of the activities that they've conducted over the quarter. Um, and then I do have directors and managers on the call as well in case there's any specific questions that you may have after I go through the highlights. So starting off with the Housing Choice Voucher Program, at this period we serve 3,823 3, households. This was an increase of 80 families from the last quarter report. We also added 37 new landlords to the Housing Choice Voucher Program and conducted 661 HQS inspections. We currently have um, 1,295 current landlords that are participating in the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Under Facilities Management Department, um, we continue to work on repairs to water lines. We've had several trench leaks uh, because of the fluctuation in the temperature. And we also had a sewage, sorry, sewer line problem in Oakley that that team worked with the city and Virginia Natural Gas to address. And I believe everyone is aware that Mr. O'Neill has retired. Um, as of December 31st, he is no longer with the Housing Authority. Uh, the Brandon Banks is stepping in to assist until we figure out the transition for that department moving forward. For the property management program, we have 3,183 units. And we have an occupancy rate right now of 98.32%. That does not include the top water or six town uh, phase one project. Tenant accounts receivables were 7.46 as of December 31st. That is up from 3.12% in December of 2020 and up from 5.42 in September of 21, which was the last quarter. 
We've had a total of six evictions uh, from July through the end of December. That's 0.24% of the total turnover, and that is still lower compared to the last year's quarter where we were at 11 or 0.45%. Under the Safety and Security Department, uh, as uh, Mr. Jackson mentioned this morning, we have a lot of activity going on in that area. Karen Rose and her staff are working with uh, several implementation of additional features in our communities. I uh, participated in 67 informal hearings between both the public housing, PPD, and HCD program, and they've removed 88 individuals from the trust pass ban listing for the quarter. Excuse me. Because I don't understand English. Um, <laughs> when you say you removed 88, does that mean 88 more people aren't allowed on the property or now are? They were not allowed and now they've been removed, so they are allowed back on the property. Okay. And that's the commitment we made that we would monthly continue to look at that that list and make sure that there weren't folks on there that needed to come on. Right. I, I, I looked through the, your report and just wanted to be sure I understood. Yes, sir. I also want to hit on uh, the design and construction management as it relates to the capital fund program. They've been very busy working on a number of projects in our community, uh, some of them being the carbon monoxide detector installation. I'm happy to say that it started and they're moving along with that. We've also started the sewer cleaning contract that they've worked on quite a bit, and we are finishing up the capital needs assessment for all of our communities. So the hope is we'll have a final report here soon from that contractor that's doing that work. And the last thing I wanted to highlight is for all of the staff that participated, uh, we had a goal to get leased up, get renovations done and leased up in the Dixtown Phase 1 RAD conversion community, uh, tax credit property. Um, we were working over the holiday, but uh, all the staff chipped in, came together and made that happen. So we got all of the units renovated, those completions done, and all of the residents approved and at least up before December 31st, which was our deadline. So staff did a great job with that. I just want to acknowledge them uh, today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, if we go, and with all this really great high-level stuff, and as I said to say, it takes years to become fluent in bureaucratic um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, language. But just a small typo okay. on this, Okay. on number four. Okay. Right, number four. It says the trespass ban removes 50, and then there's a uh, parenthesis of 88. Oh, I'm not a fire on it. Uh -huh, that's okay. Yeah, but I know you want to correct I do. It's yes. public record. Yes. Thank you. Um, and and I, I do have updated our uh, eight receivables numbers if y'all would like to have those this morning. I know we have a full agenda, so I'll say that to the committee meeting then. Okay. Are there any questions that I can answer, or any of the staff that I have on the call? Questions? A lot of information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we go on to the next, now come on. Uh, we, we have received a number of questions in the chat box. And just to let folks know that we will have staff respond to those questions. Uh, so again, we've still got a very full agenda, but I want people to know that uh, we will respond to those uh, questions. And thanks for the folks for sending the questions in. Ms. Thomas. All right. Good morning, everyone. I want to just provide you with an overview of the second quarter uh, report for the Community Engagement Division. I'm sorry, that's on page 57 of your packet. Right. Thank you. Uh, just some brief highlights to go through in the report under the uh, workforce development numbers. Uh, we see that employment trends among our resident participants really mirror those of what's going on nationally while we are seeing fewer people return, returning to structured work programs, i.e. what we would call a nine to five. We do recognize that many of our residents are actually engaged in what's considered the gig economy. Those are those uh, types of jobs like the ride share programs and delivery services. So we are still working to increase engagement and uh, as always, uh, look for ways for us to connect these resources with our residents. Seasonal employment options this year did not yield the desired number of folks that we would normally see going and I think COVID still remains as a 
key reason why folks are not returning to the workforce. You couple, couple that really with um, some uncertainties even around childcare and things of that nature with schools opening and closing. Um, so we didn't see our residents uh, really going after those seasonal employment opportunities as, as we've seen. And unfortunately, the decreased opportunities for job fairs, et cetera, not only in-house at NRHA, but really across the region, has really put a damper on how folks are accessing information about available employment. But it is not all dismal. We did see in our FSS program a family self-sufficiency and increase in enrollment. And this is key because it is for the FSS program, this is the program where residents actually are able to um, enroll once they are employed with earned income. The change from rent amount from whatever they, their baseline is up to um, the new amount is actually banked in an escrow account for up to five years. We actually see significant improvements in enrollment in that area. It is actually best and key for this program for enrollment to start while folks are at lower income levels because that just means when that income starts rolling in, that's more money to be banked. I'd also like to announce, although it didn't happen in this quarter, it is included in your family's first update that the Family Self-Sufficiency FSS program was awarded a renewal grant for three years um, through the federal government. And this year, not only did we get $200,000 more than we did in previous allotments, we are also the highest uh, awarded uh, agency in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So we are really pleased about that. We will FSS only sponsors or supports the salary of FSS coordinators. So we're going to look at some cross function through the family uh, self-sufficiency program, not only as part of client services, but perhaps in the neighborhoods as well, and identify opportunities for us to improve uh, outreach services around this program. Youth program, the out of school youth participation is up in the last quarter. We are seeing a significant amount of youth who are engaged in this program. This program gives, gives them the opportunity to learn valuable skills and trades to then translate that into actual employment. So uh, I would honestly tell you, we actually have a wait list right now for this out of school youth program. So really just delighted that this remains a very popular program in our community. I'll end with these, these, these two notes. Um, there were over 430 uh, food boxes distributed within this quarter. This was addressing the need of insecure, food insecurity in our community through both Food Bank and Norfolk Public Schools. And likewise, um, just to bring you up full to date, after the events in Young Paris in November, we uh, embarked on a partnership with some local counseling agencies and provided counseling uh, and support services to our community. And as of today, we had 23 engagements, meaning 23 folks actually partake partaken of the services, 11 being staff members, and the remaining were actually residents. And uh, there are some continual um, outreach and, and efforts being made to get folks uh, directly connected with these services so that you know we show that the support will continue as long as we need to provide that support to the community. I'll yield questions. Questions, comments? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, again, our next uh, effort is finance and administrative activities, and that starts on page 62. Have any comments on that? I mean, there's quite a Quite a bit of stuff there. All right. Hearing none. Then uh, we've got, uh, starting on page 66, a number of committee minutes. Oh, uh, there was one item I wanted to. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Under um, the finance and, and administrative activities, um, Item number two, and that was uh, in response to a, the question that, okay. I, that that I received about the contracts that have the uh, renewal provision, and is there a process in place? It was specifically about the legal services, but it's
pertains to all of our professional services contracts. And I just, I, I wanted the commissioners to know that there is a, you know, before a contract is, if it, if it does have the renewal provision, there is a performance-based review as well as a monetary review to make sure that the, the costs are in line. I have a, a Kathy, Kath, Kathy Mosley, our uh, Director of Administrative Services on the line, just to go, just briefly go over the process. Okay. So, uh, Kathy? Yes, sir, I'm here. Yes. Good morning, commissioners, um, Mr. Jackson, Ms. Carnes. Uh, really briefly, just in regards to the process for contract renewal, um, we do have a simplified process where 60 to 90 days prior to a contract being renewed, we send out notification to the end user. Um, then the end user will elect to uh, renew this contract. Um, exercising option years is based on both available funding and contractor performance. So at the end of a year, if it's a, an option year contract, at the end of a year, the end user will receive a NRHA contractor performance assessment report. And that report is sent to the end user, sent back to in, um, procurement and we'll file that for action. That form is used to determine if we will proceed with executing an option year, especially if that performance um, reflects anything negative. So it's a pretty simplified process. It goes to the end user. The end user will decide, yes, I want to renew this option year. If it has option years available, um, we get two signatures for that, a requester and an authorizer. Um, then it comes to procurement budget um, for funding approval, and then we'll exercise that option year. Um, really what's important to know is that we do do a contractor performance at the end of every year, um, determining whether or not that contractor is performing um, to par. Okay. Questions, comments? Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, Kathy. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, back to uh, any committee meeting. Uh, nope. Jen Whitemore texted me. She said Mr. Benassi wanted to make a comment, but oh. he's muted. Okay, Jen. Can you unmute yourself? I think Makisha has to do it, maybe. Makisha, do you? Ken, are you still there? Can you hear us? Of course, if you can't tell back, you can't tell us that you can hear us. I can't hear Makisha. He's self-muted. He's self-muted. Can you unmute yourself, Ken? Well, I, yes, finally. I, we we there got you a little go. technology here. I was blocked out uh, by the organizer for an hour. Um, I do have a comment uh, on um, the finance uh, subcommittee. Uh, we were informed that we have a massive write-off that we are dealing with on City View Tower. And um, we've, we've obtained a judgment, and uh, this is, this is going to hurt really badly if we do not get some kind of recompense on this situation. The truth of the matter is some, the property manager and, and senior management probably made the conclusion, if we did not continue to accommodate this lack of payment, we're gonna lose a tenant anyway, and we would have an empty building, which is probably the same net effect to the, to the organization. But what it really is calling the sharp relief is the problem that City View Tower is having on our uh, reserves and why we own this asset. So. Um, Ron, I spoke with uh, Virginia 
and yeah. uh, Scott about this. And this is something that I think we really got to put into very, uh, we, we got to come up with an action plan here I, because it's getting worse, not getting better. I agree. And that was our plan to, to bring something to the committee. Uh, that would be the budget of finance and also a development committee in, in March. We're just trying to get all of our uh, all of our information together and make sure that we uh, sort of give you an accurate picture of where we are and, and our options. Yes, th thanks, Ron. I, I, I know you hadn't gotten sleep on this, but I, I, even if we collect yeah. this money, it, it, yeah. it, 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 we have got to come up with some 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 tough plans. I know you'll set the yeah. stage for that. And it will be complicated, and yeah. we, time is really not on our side. But uh, this is a um, one of those things that we're going to have to put a high priority on. And whether you create a subcommittee to uh, assist in all of this, it's a it's a complex but necessary undertaking. That's all. Yeah. That's that's the extent of my comments. So by the way, there is a path. Ron, to to get, I don't know if you've connected with uh, the property manager, but the, I know there is a path that will be make it very very difficult on this tenant to not pay us, um, and so we need to pursue that uh, path. But it doesn't change the bigger picture either. Okay. All thanks, right. Ken. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Okay. Um, other questions and comments on the uh, committee meeting notes? Uh, I know we are going to try uh, again with the wonderful technology uh, a virtual meeting with a, a housing and safety committee. Uh, we're going to see how see if we can work that in. Uh, and hope, but again, the, the goal ultimately is to get back out into the community. So, but we are going to try this sort of Zoom thing with the community here uh, shortly. So, just to give you an update on that. Um, I guess the next uh, thing that we have is a closed session. Ms. Card, do you have the paper? You don't have it. Okay. What's that? Oh, that's okay. Yes, She's got it. No, that's okay. Be it resolved that the authority will convene in a closed meeting pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act as amended, the Act, to discuss the following matters which are specifically exempted from public disclosure by the code section referred to below. Consultation with the authority's legal counsel regarding probable litigation requiring the provision of legal advice of counsel as authorized by section 2.2 dash 3711A7 of the Act. May I have a motion, please? Um, a second, please? Yes. Ms. Arrington? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Ms. Courier? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Mr. Musacho? Aye. Uh, as normal, we take about five minutes re reminding everyone to not talk about any business whatsoever. And we'll go ahead and prepare for the closed session. So again, about five, about five minutes.
resolutions certifying a closed session, whereas the authority has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas section 2.2-3712D of the Virginia Code of 1950 as amended requires a certification by this authority that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, upon motion duly made and seconded, be it resolved that the authority hereby certifies that to the best of each commissioner's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the authority. May I have a motion, please? So moved. A second. 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 <clears throat> Commissioner Arrington? Aye. Commissioner Benassi? Aye. Commissioner Purrier? Aye. Commissioner Gresham? Aye. Commissioner Mitaccio? Aye. Thank you. Okay, the uh, last item we have are some uh, updates, and that starts on page uh, 114. Uh, do, we, do we get a presentation on this, or is it? No, it's in no. the packet. There's the packet, pack, yeah. Okay, if you'll take a second to look at those if you have any questions. I didn't see anything that Ken hung up. was of note. Okay. Other comments or questions? Anything else for the good of the cause? Mm -hmm. No questions. No questions? No thing? Then I will go ahead and call the February Board of Commissioners meeting to a close. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,